the topic today is uh, nutrition and diet therapy and neurodevelopmental disabilities. Just a very brief review of this topic. Um, I'm sure many of you know that nutrition status has a significant impact on the overall health and certainly quality of life for these kids. And oftentimes malnutrition is associated with impaired linear growth and perhaps some increased spasticity and irritability, certainly in our CP population. And then at the other end of the spectrum, overnutrition can also lead to uh, reduced participation for these kids in educational and social activities, in addition to other stigma that they may experience and overall make caregiving for them, um, certainly with their activities of daily living, such as bathing and toileting, more difficult. So over the next uh, remaining minutes, I thought uh, we could just review and define some nutrition assessment methodology that's typically used by the dietitians and perhaps some others on the care team. Uh, summarize some common causes for delayed growth and, uh, and poor skills development, oral skills development, evaluate possible solutions to some posed problems, and lastly conclude with a short analysis of obesity in this, um, this at-risk population too. So I thought we'd start with just a sample case study that I found in a textbook here where we have Jimmy who's a uh, five-year-old with quadriplegic spastic um, cerebral palsy and he's been referred to you for um, gastric tube insertion because um, everyone's a little concerned about his growth. He doesn't have any speech um, and, no, and he does have some difficulties with chewing and swallowing um, but doesn't uh, cough or uh, choke and has no history of aspiration and um, he is fed exclusively orally with um, feeding times approximately 120 minutes per day. And so the anthropometrics that we have are that is current height is 85 centimeters and his weight is 12 kilos. So the question becomes would you assess him or assess his growth on a standard growth chart and this standard chart is one from the United States CDC and published in 2000 and so if you were to plot his weight and his stature on again a standard growth curve it would it would appear that he is undernourished or again um, at least in terms of his stature growth at least uh, nearly three three standard deviations below uh, the lowest percentile but instead because of his condition um, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware that there are other um, growth parameters or growth standards that you could compare his height and his weight to which may be more appropriate for his condition and in fact, there are recent um, cerebral palsy growth curves that have been published. Um, they were published in 2011. And, um, and I've given you a, uh, the reference for that um, appears at the end of the slide presentation, which again might be more appropriate to, again, just comparing height and weight and certainly trajectory over, over time using, uh, again, a population that bit, might be more similar to then um, the patient that you have. And th this is where his height and his weight for age would, would plot then on these curves. Again, that they do follow, or at least they certainly appear on the curve when compared to a cohort with a similar um, disability. There are different cerebral palsy growth curves depending on the uh, motor ability of the condition. And uh, again, I've, I've given you the reference here that the gross motor function classification system is classified in five, um, five ways, um, which I've highlighted here. And again, there are growth curves associated with each um, motor function classification. There are also growth curves that have been fairly well established for the Down syndrome population. And these curves have been recently updated um, in 2017, um, published in Pediatrics with the first author, Zemel. Um, this, the study behind these curves looked at 
um, a group of children from birth to 20 years um, in a general peds practice or other interest groups, community events, um, schools, again, in Philadelphia. They were all there from the clinic at the Children's Hospital of, uh, of Philadelphia. So there were 637 participants in this study, too. And again, it's a, a convenient sample of contemporary children. Again, what, um, what we find most helpful is, again, getting an idea of being able to compare you know, your patient's um, anthropometrics to some other um, group. Just to, it just gives you an idea, again, of how well um, your patient is doing as compared to some standardized norm. So in addition to anthropometric measurements, there are other components of nutrition assessment that a dietitian does consider when we're evaluating the nutritional status of a patient. Um, we like to look, again, at the medical history of the patient, um, including, again, the, the neurological disorder of the patient, perhaps age in which the um, patient might have had some feeding difficulties, and also reviewing their medications. Um, another important history that we, we um, pay particular attention to is a diet history or, quote, a feeding history from the family, and that's usually gathered in a three- to seven-day food diary, which can detail, again, what the child is eating and drinking. And we'll look at, again, what they're eating, in particular, um, types, textures of food, viscosity, and quantity, quality, and, um, and feeding route. Also, I just put up some pictures here to help highlight for you, um, for example, some modified food textures. I've got a bowl of, of mashed food, again, that may be altered and used depending on the patient's oral and feeding skills. Um, in particular, we can we look at how much time it actually takes to feed the child. If it's an excessive amount of time, then that can also uh, contribute to poor dietary intake. The frequency of meals themselves or the frequency of snacks. So look at, again, um, the environment and, and perhaps who actually does the feeding. Is it mom? Is it some other caregiver, babysitter, daycare? And then in regards to the environment, is it, is it chaotic? Um, this little girl, it appears that she's enjoying herself too, but perhaps there's other distractions going on. And so these are all good questions to ask about mealtime itself. Giving you here just an overview of some other factors that can impact um, a child's growth and oral skill development, in particular on the left-hand side of the diagram looking at other, um, like why they are um, prone to uh, perhaps some um, poor growth outcome in terms of the communication abilities of the child themselves, other feeding dysfunctions, um, physical um, positioning of the, of the child, um, their overall neurologic maturation, again, can all again, contribute to a limited food intake. So we do have some tricks of the trade in regards to what to do if your patient's growth does indicate undernutrition. Um, we can um, try to, again, increase the calories that a, that a child receives either by adding fat or adding protein to the food item or the actual meal or snack itself. It usually doesn't work very well to increase uh, portion size or increased frequency of foods because um, it, it provide, it's, it's a little bit more stressful and oftentimes it just doesn't work well into um, the, you know, the daily routine of, of the, the family themselves. But rather trying to concentrate calories into um, what foods are actually that the kid will actually eat is, is usually helpful. So again, um, adding fats would be, um, again, trying to use some gravies, adding 
butter to things, now's the time to try you know, full fat dairy products, for example, other types of sauces, and um, an inexpensive way to increase protein into a child's diet would be to use some type of dry milk powder, um, which can be found easily on a grocery store shelf. And, um, and as we know, there are a number of oral supplements that are also available um, over the counter now, which um, a family can use in place of, um, for example, some other dairy product or um, that, and again, that is more calorically dense and more and does contain more vitamins and minerals. Um, so what do you do or what can be done with a, a picky eater? Well, there's, um, if you haven't heard about this before or this, this term, um, you can try um, something called food chaining. Um, there was a, a book published about 10 years ago about this in terms of how to expand a, a picky child's um, repertoire or uh, in terms of food choices that they, they would find acceptable. And of course the goal is trying to prevent the, the kid from any type of sensory overload and trying to, to, again, start with a food that the child already eats or that already accepts and then trying to progress from one food to another one. So for example, what this um, diagram illustrates is um, in the first bubble, you have, a, have someone that's um, willing to eat french fries and where you could try to, you know, again, expand the diet would be into something similar to a french fry but maybe a different shape such as a waffle fry, um, a tater tot, or perhaps hash brown. So you are still in the same food type, but yet it has, you know, it has a different appearance, perhaps a slightly different texture and mouthfeel. And it's not, uh, it's certainly not an overnight um, solution, but instead the literature does support that you need to consistently try the same version of the food item multiple times, maybe even for several meals or several days before giving up and um, it is suggested that you try at least 15 to upwards of 25 times. And then once the item is accepted, then you'd want to then try something else. Again, trying to again gradually change um, the number of accepted items into this kind of format. And of course, this takes a lot of patience and, um, and time, but um, certainly worth, um, worth trying. Um, like Dr. Phelps said earlier in, um, in her presentations, there are certainly other team members that can assist um, with you know, these, these types of, of eating behaviors. Again, um, food aversions, oral versions, and, um, and we do have something um, called a feeding team, which can, again, concentrate certainly on feeding dysfunction, um, the positioning of the child, and again, assessment of the neurologic maturation of the, of the um, oral um, abilities of the kid themselves. And in addition to the dietitian, a feeding team can consist of these other um, personnel, such as, um, and I'll let you read that for yourself, mainly at least at um, the University of Michigan in my experience and then talking with some of the other practitioners, um, it's really important to have your speech pathologist, your physical therapist, and your occupational therapist on board. Um, and they are, they are the experts in this whole area. Um, gastrointestinal issues such as dysphagia and gastroesophageal reflux are common in, in children with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, and then and perhaps I'm already stating the obvious, um, here just for review, swallowing is a complicated process and in fact just um, doing the review for, for this webinar, um, just reminding myself and others that eating and drinking actually involves 31 coordinated muscles and six cranial nerves. So if we have, if your um, patient or client has any type of physical dysfunction in any of these areas, then you can see why um, dysphagia and reflux are, 
are so common. And typically, swallowing um, difficulties involves an impairment of one of the three phases of swallowing itself. Um, these types of GI issues are a major chronic problem, and it's estimated upwards of 80 to 90 percent of patients with cerebral palsy and other disabilities experience this, including reflux too. Reflux, gastroesophageal reflux, can be caused by many factors here that I've, um, I've documented for you. So if you have a patient that, again, um, has poor oral intake, you've, you've made your referral to a feeding team, you've concentrated oral intake, and yet still, um, unfortunately, experiences poor growth, um, then enteral nutrition support um, via the, typically a gastrostomy tube may be indicated, certainly in patients that have growth failure. And, um, you know, whether um, a PEG or, again, a, how you place the tube, whether it's um, percutaneously, endoscopically placed, or surgically placed, um, is, again, a medical decision along with the family. But here I've pictured just um, have for you a picture of a, a couple of gastrostomy tubes there and a child who does have a G-tube in place. And now, lastly, I just wanted to conclude um, at the other end of the spectrum um, in regards to obesity among children with special needs. And um, just some, uh, just a few facts uh, about the problem itself. Here, um, I, I did forget to put in one line. The definition of overweight is, is usually measured, is measured by children with a BMI greater than or equal to the 85th percentile on the growth curve. And then the definition of obesity in children is a BMI greater than or equal to 95%, um, again, for children of the same age and sex. And we use, um, we have a, a curve that is, um, is used along, and again, published by the CDC. In fact, um, 20, as I stated here in the second bullet, 22% of children with disabilities are obese. And that compares to approximately 16% of children without disabilities. And this is in the United States. Uh, more girls are impacted than boys. And um, one study even looks at um, looking in 2010 um, using um, some well-documented survey data that we have available in this country, measuring the BMI of 461 adolescents um, ages 12 to 18 with a physical, intellectual, or behavioral disability. And 67% of those teens on the, um, with the autism spectrum disorder are either overweight or obese. Um, the number of 86% um, of teens with Down syndrome are either overweight or obese. Um, and um, upwards of 19% of teenagers with cerebral palsy are also obese. So um, just wanted to make sure and make you aware of that. There's, there certainly are unique risk factors um, for obesity in this population. In addition to the documented risk factors for obesity um, with, with um, non-disabled children, that um, these kids often have, again, a um, a complex relationship with food. Um, when we talk about um, promoting a healthy diet in the family and the children, um, oftentimes um, families may be experiencing enough behavioral battles, so they just really don't want to fight over food itself. Um, they're also influenced by their peers, and so they want to fit in, and oftentimes that means that they're also drinking soda or eating fast food, too. Uh, these children have um, physical barriers to exercise, and sometimes they get tired. They often may need uh, modified equipment, and this type of equipment or modification can come at a price. And so there are some recent surveys that indicate that, there, that we do lack facilities and programs near um, families' homes. 75% um, of special health care needs children take at least one prescription medication. And many of these medications are associated with weight gain. So it's also something to keep in mind. Um, family stress can contribute to 
because if you have a family that's worried about, um, you know, has financial issues, perhaps even food security problems, in addition to, you know, making multiple medical appointments or transportation responsibilities, eating, you know, your daily fruits and vegetables may definitely take a, a back seat to that. Other unique property or um, factors that uh, play in with this population, um, there are certain genetic disorders that have obesity as a clinical feature. Um, sometimes um, families, um, particularly um, teachers, maybe some school coaches, might perceive risk with um, certain activity and therefore may not promote that um, with some kids. Um, this population is also at risk for social isolation with just fewer friends, missing out on opportunities to have free play. And screen time. Um, certainly screen time is um, a risk factor for all children in this country, uh, but certainly in this, in this group, it's strongly associated with the city. Uh, one proposed model for obesity treatment, which again, um, I think carries over to um, just the entire pediatric population, is um, certainly involving the, the child in the center of the decisions about making um, about their own health and certainly about their own their own fitness, but um, interpersonal. Um, groups such as, again, the family, the friends, the peers, trying to making sure that in addition to promoting and changing a child's eating and physical activity habits, um, also making a conscious effort to perhaps change their own or uh, commitment to their own um, healthy lifestyle. Organizationally, um, looking at our schools, again, healthcare sites, everyone that's working in the child's life try and promote a healthy way. Our communities can certainly do more, and I think we're, we're trying to address that in regards to our neighborhoods, our cities, our towns. Um, how can we change our own environment? And lastly, society. Certainly our own um, state and national policies have a role to play in obesity treatment and prevention. So my last slide here has um, a number of references that I've, I found helpful putting this together. And thank you for your time. <laughs>